Welcome to Island Watch, where each episode we explore an island by watching a TV show or a movie. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale. Hi, I'm Dave Zarg. And I'm Gemma Voss. And yes, welcome to Island Watch, the podcast that transports you to islands all over the world. If you're up for a getaway, you've come to the right place. This week, we are awash in islands. The good ship Island Watch is visiting the entire South Pacific via South Pacific. Some enchanted evening. Nope, not that South Pacific. South Pacific, the documentary. All aboard. So here we are, sailing through the South Pacific, where 99% of the area is water, water, and more water. This is definitely the most watery episode we may ever make. But without all that briny stuff, there would be no South Pacific Islands, no archipelagos stretching over hundreds and thousands of kilometers. We're going to be making lightning speed ports of call at a number of islands today. So be sure you've got your good deck shoes and your trusty flotation device, because it's going to be a wild and crazy ride. So, first things first. Today's Island Watch is not the controversial Rodgers and Hammerstein musical and movie. The South Pacific we are reviewing is a 2009 documentary put out by the BBC. Very different creatures and likely why the documentary was renamed for the United States, where it's called Wild Pacific, which in some ways is a better name. How do you figure? Well, the show features Hawaii pretty prominently, but Hawaii isn't technically in the South Pacific. It's north of the equator, right? That's right. Okay. Another change from South Pacific to Wild Pacific, and this will come as kind of a letdown to any Benedict Cumberbatch fans. He narrated... The original South Pacific, but for the American version, they hired Mike Rowe. Maybe people know him from hosting the show Dirty Jobs. And obviously, Mike and Benedict bring different things to the table. So choose your experience. For the record, we watched the original version with Benedict's narration. We've met him before here on Island Watch, as he was one of the four leads for the TV miniseries Small Island, which we reviewed last season the show about Jamaican post-war immigration to the UK. Small Island actually came out the same year as South Pacific, both in 2009, and a year later, Benedict became a household name with Sherlock. He does a fine job with the narration. The stately pacing, the plummy tone. Mm Mm-hmm, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, except for a quirk of his that was highlighted on the Graham Norton talk show a few years after the documentary came out. Oh, you mean the bit about the Southern Hemisphere's nemesis to Batman? (laughs) Yeah, you got it. If it sounds like we're talking in code, it's because we're about to play a clip, and the clip is funnier if you don't hear us saying the name of the tuxedo-wearing fish eater. So here's Graham Norton talking about the number one request the show receives when people know that Benedict will be appearing on the show. Of all the questions we had... The one that came up most often was, <laughs> ask Benedict to say the word penguin. <laughs> <laughs> what is this about? Well, apparently I got it wrong repeatedly in the documentary. <laughs> it wasn't a documentary about said animal. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a documentary about, I think about the South Pacific in general. And now I'm completely terrified of the word. Um, I don't go near it. Well, no, because I know, here's the thing. I thought, oh, I'm and sure yeah. they're making it up, but we actually look You've got at it? this documentary. Oh, good. So the documentary is called... Good. The documentary is called Strange Islands. The first one you sort of get away with, and then after that you lose all sense of what we're <laughs> doing. Oh, uh, let's, let's have a look. Listen carefully. And the last thing you might expect to see here... ..is penguins. <laughs> These are Fiordland crested penguins, named after this corner of South New Zealand. So why are these woodlands so attractive to penguins? A freshwater stream through the forest makes a handy highway for a parent penguin heading home from a fishing trip. (laughs) 
Well, even the most erudite of actors can sometimes get things wrong. But it's worth a laugh. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, penguins. It's sort of weird that no one in the actual production crew corrected him. I, I don't know. Did they just, I don't know if they just checked out or what, but there's got to be some explanation for how that stayed in the final cut. It makes you wonder. But anyway, there's a lot more to this show than Benedict Cumberbatch or Penguins. Yeah, maybe we should talk about why we chose to review this show. Good point. Each season we review at least one documentary. And by the way, listeners, if you have suggestions for documentaries, especially those made on an island, about the island, please let us know. For sure. It's not a genre with a lot of contenders. Anyway, we also look to balance where the islands for each season are around the world. And we definitely always want to feature a show from this area of the Pacific. We'd like to feature more movies from islands around Africa too, but those are harder to come by. So again, if you have suggestions, please let us know. So we chose this documentary, hoping it would take us to lots of South Pacific islands. And it does, because it's covering a massive area. No other ocean has had a greater impact on the lives of so many different animals and cultures than the South Pacific. And it's all down to its massive size. The whole Pacific Ocean is so large you could fit the world's continents inside it with nearly enough room for another Africa. 10,000 miles wide, less than 1% is land. 10,000 miles is more than 16,000 kilometers, or about the distance of flying from Vancouver to New York and back again, twice. Wow. And on top of that, there are more than 20,000 islands in the South Pacific. Yeah, you know, that means if you made a salad dressing for it, it would be at least 20 times as tasty as the one you can buy now. What? You know, Thousand Island Dressing, but times 20. 20,000 islands. Okay, well maybe we ought to work on developing that over at Island Watch Kitchens. I think that would be a tasty legacy. Maybe we should do that. Right. Anyway, the Pacific Ocean contains more than one quarter of all of the world's water. I mean, the scale of the ocean is just absolutely unfathomable. Ah, uh, nice pun. Okay, moving on. One of the things I really liked about this documentary is the amount I learned about this area of the world. I mean, We've skirted it with our show on Top End Wedding, the Australian comedy we did a few episodes back, and with the wayfaring that was a major plot point in Moana that we visited last season. And we've also visited a few times with our Find the Island segments, and also in our Kiribati episode. Yeah, I've been gaining knowledge bit by bit as we research a show, and then this documentary helped pull a lot of it into context by sort of doing a show and tell about the ocean itself. So what are some of the things that you learned? It's not just the water that is vast, the storms in the Pacific. Yeah, they mentioned cyclones there can span up to 600 miles, almost a thousand kilometers across, which is about the distance between Rome and Munich. And that's a storm. It's <laughs> just, so I need to put in a nerd sidebar here. The difference between hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons. They are all the same thing. They're tropical storms, but they're known by different names in different locations. So in the North Atlantic Ocean and the Northeast Pacific Ocean, they're called hurricanes. But if the same type of disturbance takes place in the Northwest Pacific Ocean, it's known as a typhoon. And in the South Pacific and Indian Ocean, that tropical storm is called a cyclone. Good. Glad we got that straightened out. But cyclones aren't just massively destructive. They also move life around, carrying everything from seeds and insects to birds and bats, even lizards, carrying them hundreds of kilometers. Cyclones swoop up and carry them along. Most die, but some make landfall. They survive. And, well, this concept shapes Episode 2 of South Pacific. It's called Castaways, about how these transfers are one of the ways that life spread around the ocean. I don't think we've mentioned yet, this is a six-hour documentary made of six different episodes. Right. Well, we've mentioned it now. I mean, there's a lot to cover in a review of six hours of material. 
Yeah, no kidding. So if our job is challenging, trying to pack in reviewing six hours of material in 15 to 20 minutes, imagine the challenge to the filmmakers of trying to cover the entire South Pacific Ocean and its 20,000 islands in six hours. Actually, that's a helpful perspective, because with the vastness of this topic, the series can feel kind of watered down. However, at the end of each episode, there's a really interesting 10-minute segment called South Pacific Diary. Those diaries are many How This Was Made features. Right, and the diaries lay out exactly what the filmmakers were trying to achieve and the steps they took to get there. For example, when they were trying to find a monster wave and film a surfer riding within it. Or when they send a film crew off in a boat across the Solomon Island chain, trying to capture footage of the biggest saltwater crocodile they could find. Hashtag this boat's going the wrong way. The peacekeepers had recommended the wild and mostly uninhabited coast of Guadalcanal. On the tip-off of a large crocodile scene laying up on this lonely stretch of beach, Wade set up his camera hide one last time and the long wait began. Yet it was at dawn, after a three-day vigil, that an impressive three-meter crocodile finally appeared. In the end, Wade only managed to record a few minutes of footage of these camera-shy giants. But these images were proof of the existence of large saltwater crocodiles in the Solomons, the last living legends in the South Pacific. Each diary has a structure, a beginning, middle, and end. Actually, I wonder if they initially thought of structuring the show around those diary pieces. Like, what do you mean? Flipping it and making the diary the narrative? Yeah, but then maybe they thought that they would lose the focus on the ocean, which is, after all, the title character. I don't know. It's creative quicksand. Well, you know, I wanted to resist this comparison, but it's sort of the elephant in the room. It's the elephant seal in the room. I'm thinking of Sir David Attenborough, the famous British broadcaster and natural historian. He's been behind some of the most fascinating and thoughtful nature documentaries since the 1950s. Programs like Life on Earth and The Living Planet, or his latest, David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, which just came out in 2020. Now, incidentally, he is now in his mid-90s. And his huge body of work has set the bar pretty high. It's very high. It's like he didn't even just set the bar. It's like he made the bar and then set it there, right? And because of that, I've I've sort of been trained by those David Attenborough documentaries. And then seeing this one, it's good, but it's just missing that something, something. Now, granted, this show is now 12 years old. And you know from watching those diary segments and just being part of the world in general, technology for creating these shows is always cutting edge. So it's at a disadvantage in that sense. Fair enough. But there's something else that it isn't technological, but it doesn't quite meet the Attenborough mark. They had so many bits and pieces that they wanted to put it all in. But for me, that's not as narratively satisfying. And the show comes off as sort of jumbled. That might be it. It's not so much a story. It feels like a curiosity cabinet, a cabinet where things pop out at you and you're like, wow, I never knew that. Or, wow, I've never seen that before. Right. Which is not to say that it's a bad show. I mean, there's nothing in this that's not interesting. No, it's very interesting, but it's not necessarily engrossing. Does that make sense? Interesting, but not engrossing, because after a while, it's possible to tire of the continuous novelty. One tactic you could use to enjoy the show is to imagine maybe your, um, what is the name of the Tom Hanks character in Castaway? Um, Chuck Noland. Chuck Noland, right. Yeah, he's the shipwrecked survivor. Remember, he's stuck on a South Pacific island, just waiting for things to drift in on the waves. Yeah, exactly. It's like Chuck sitting there on the beach, the waves are washing in all the FedEx packages from the plane crash, and he opens most of them to find things to help. And I say most of them because maddeningly for me, he doesn't open all the packages, which I still can't stop thinking of, even though we watched that show at the beginning of our first season. Can't let it go. But you'll have to if you want to make your point. Okay, okay. So 
watching this documentary is like you're sitting on a beach in the South Pacific, like Chuck, water all around, stuff is washing in, you open it up, you don't know what you'll find inside, but it will be of interest to you. But there is a great deal of randomness to what shows up. I see what you're saying. Like one of those things that washes up is coconuts. Right. <laughs> the coconuts. As soon as we have a tropical show on Island Watch, I know I'll be writing about coconuts for Island Watch Picnic Picks, which is the part of our website where we make a picnic specifically designed to watch with the movie or TV show we're reviewing. And just, I mean, there's a ton of coconut recipes out there because there's a ton of coconuts. Well, maybe you could invite some special guests to your next coconut-centered picnic. Oh, I think you probably mean those crazy crabs on Matoma Island? Yeah, the robber crab, a.k.a. the coconut crab. These crabs grow up to four kilograms in mass, and their leg span can be one meter. Okay, it's not because they look like coconuts that they're called the coconut crab. They can carry coconuts, like a crab carrying a coconut. It's not a cartoon, people. This is real. But it's actually not the amazing part. They, they carry the coconut to wherever it is. They like to dine al fresco. And then they crack open the coconut with their own claws. Yeah. My jaw was dropping open watching this. Yeah. They can exert 335 kilograms of force, about 90 times their body weight. It is just one of the critters in this series that will blow your mind. And even, actually not a critter, but you know, I think we need to talk more about the coconuts. It's ubiquitous, but it's got, like we have to think about it because it has superpowers actually. The humble coconut. Its seed is a compact survival capsule. Buoyant and filled with food for germination, it can survive for up to two months at sea, long enough to float from one remote island to the next. On arrival, it lays down roots into bare sand and taps into the reservoirs of underground fresh water. Without coconuts, most of the tropical islands in the South Pacific would have remained uninhabitable for both animals and people. I had no idea that coconuts could sprout right on the sand and grow a tree. Well, they are seeds, so... Yeah, I don't know why I didn't put that together. But but the forces that they have to resist to do that, I mean, they're just sitting on the beach and they can sprout into a tree. So they have to resist cyclones and waves, salt water. I mean, those are crazy survival skills. Well, they are. And humans have them too. I mean, we haven't mentioned humans much yet, but I like this clip about how people of the South Pacific were able to travel those vast ocean distances thousands of years ago. The Lapita's first voyages into the unknown must have appeared suicidal. Although many were lost at sea, some Lapita did reach new islands. Thanks to their extraordinary navigation skills, this man can interpret the direction of land by reading wave and swell patterns. Like his ancestors, he carries in his head a complex wind map detailing the various seasonal winds that serve as a compass. And at night, he can navigate by the stars. In craft like these, the Lapita reached the islands of Tonga, 2,000 miles east of New Guinea, in the heart of the South Pacific. This is what I mean about watching the series and having it tie things together for me. The bit of research I did on Polynesians and their ancient wayfinding skills, actually that was for Moana, but here you see someone using these ancient skills right now. But also there are some pretty heart-stopping moments we see with other South Pacific folks. The segment of the meaningful origins on the bungee jump, for example, or the ritual scarification of the people who try to make peace with saltwater crocodiles. I hadn't ever seen or imagined living like this. And you get a quick glimpse and then it's gone. The glimpse actually that riveted me the most was the lagoon of the shrieking eels. Well, they weren't really shrieking. No, that was me shrieking and jumping up the back of the couch. These eels, 
they looked as big around as a personal pan pizza. Am I exaggerating? No. No, right? And I think they said they grow up to two meters long. I was squirming more than the eels. Well, it was <laughs> mesmerizing. I mean, the people sitting by the water, they held out food and the eels like slithered up and snatched the food from their hands. Yeah. Okay, the eels were rushing up from the water and there, I mean, there were young kids there and I was like, get away, get away. But then Benedict pipes in to explain. The eels are highly prized by the locals. These Solomon Islanders hand feed them, not to fatten them up for dinner, but to encourage them to stick around. By scavenging on whatever's decaying here, the eels clean the islanders' precious pools of drinking water, and over time, the honorary guests have become tame. It would take me a month of Sundays before I could get comfortable with an eel eating from my hand. It's not that I hate eels, right? It's just, no. But you could see everyone on screen was calm. After the initial shock, I thought, I guess... It's more like, like, I don't know, slopping the pigs or feeding the dog than the horror movie it first appeared. So have you made a full recovery? Yeah, I'll get there. Okay. I mean, there are some heebie-jeebie moments in this documentary. Squeamish moments are par for the course, really, in most nature documentaries. But, okay, weren't you freaked out by the fruit bats with a four-foot wingspan? Well, I don't have a visceral fear of bats. I mean, they just do their thing. In a documentary, it's fine once I get over that first flutter of them on the screen. And watching them fly around in real life in the dusk, hey, you know, they're enjoying their all-you-can-eat buffet. It's a win-win because they can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes in one hour. So yay bats. I didn't really like the saltwater crocodiles or the foot-long millipedes. They were kind of cringe-inducing. Yeah. But then, you know, not all nature shots are going to be cuddly. I mean, this isn't Izzy's koala world, which we visited last season. No, that was full of cuddles and warm fuzzies. But anyway, you're right. Okay, so stuff in this documentary terrified me. You should stay away from bats, and you should stay away from carnivorous caterpillars and leave them to their own affairs. They don't need you, and you don't have to think about wanting to stay away from saltwater crocodiles. I mean, if you don't want to die, I think it's, you know, a good plan. Yeah, all those feelings make sense, but then there are things that horrified me. Well, what horrified you? Was it the environmental destruction? Mm-hmm. That's exactly it. You know, when we first started this podcast, I, I had an interest in islands, mainly as a nice place to get away, like a total change in environment, in scenery, in how people living there express themselves through their cultures. And we've put in months of work on researching and writing. I'm now really attached to islands and their cultures all over the world. I know what you mean. I mean, I value the opportunity that we've had to learn so much about diverse cultures and locations. Not just from the movies and shows, but also from the research that we've done for the podcast. It's given me a greater appreciation for those places. And so it's, it's all the more devastating to realize that we are making the world change so much for the worse. Because of indifference and, well, greed. And this beauty, plant and animal life, human cultures on many Pacific islands and elsewhere, they aren't going to survive if we don't get our act together. We are the species screwing this up for the rest of the planet. You're right. Shows like South Pacific should be a call to action. Earth is the only Class M planet we have, and we should not mess it up. This documentary series was made 12 years ago. The final episode is called Fragile Paradise, and it's not hard to see why. And they were talking about populations of fish crashing within just a few years. So what's been done since? It doesn't look that promising. The overfishing is particularly galling. Yeah, the images in the documentary that will likely stay with me the longest, one is of a turtle trapped in a fishnet, and it's panicking and suffocating because she can't get to the surface for oxygen. And it was absolutely visceral. At the last moment, a fisherman reaches in and cuts her loose. And Benedict comments, 
it's because it's seen as bad luck to haul a turtle onto the boat. But how often, I mean, how often is that going to happen when there's no film crew there? It's a huge problem. And then we see this type of fishing net called a purse seine net. It's a truly gigantic circle that traps everything. As the net closes, a draw cord running along the bottom of the net is pulled tight. The net becomes a bag or purse and the fish are trapped. There are 150 tons of fish in this one haul. It used to take a fishing vessel one whole year to catch this many fish. This was another visceral image. And the final diary episode of the last episode of the series, it tells the story of how the videographers actually swam within the Persane net to film. So they're inside the net, you know, with like heavy equipment. They're surrounded by 150 tons of mainly tuna, although the net captures whatever's in the area. And the net is called a persane because it tightens just like a bag around the fish and traps them inside. And I don't know, I, I figure those videographers must still have nightmares of being in there. It's very hard to watch. We need to feed people, but we've seen this play out before. I mean, countries have fished their water so hard that fish stocks completely crashed. And the South Pacific is really the last part of our planet that has reasonably stocked fishing grounds. But boats from all over, like Asia, Europe, and the Americas, are here and scooping up the bounty. The Pacific Islanders are trying to change things. They've been pushing for that whole part of the Pacific to be declared a marine reserve. Another thing I learned from this series is that the high seas isn't just some vague term from a pirate movie. It is actually maritime law. The high seas are specifically, it means any of the mass of salt water that isn't a territorial sea or internal waters of a state. So right now, because the high seas are unprotected, any country can fish there or do anything else for that matter. And of course, the fish don't pay attention to whose waters they're in, which means an international collaborative effort is needed to prevent overfishing and prevent huge numbers of extinctions. So drawing this back in, like we mentioned, this documentary ranges wildly. So you're going to see little, tiny, adorable, happy face spiders in Hawaii. That's really what they're called. To overfishing and the dire need for protection of marine habitats. It covers a lot, but it does shine a spotlight on the environmental challenges, as well as the wild beauty of that part of the world. Time for ratings. Here at Island Watch, we give each watch two different ratings. First, our island rating, which answers the question, how much of an island feel do we get from the show? So Dave... Did South Pacific give you a big island feeling? We sailed all over this huge ocean, and we visited a huge number of islands, from Macquarie Island, which is south of New Zealand, all the way up to the Hawaiian Islands, and from New Guinea on the western side of the ocean, over to Easter Island, which is much closer to South America. And we saw lots of flora, fauna, and cultures of those places. So I'll give it four and a half out of five, mostly splashing in the surf. How about you, Gemma? I like the show for flipping my view of islands. It's islands viewed from the ocean instead of the other way around. And it's about how the water ties all of these places together. There's so much more than we were able to fit in our discussion, obviously. And watching it, you're guaranteed to see things you've never seen before. If you're craving some novelty within your four walls, that's a great reason to watch. What I love the most is coming away with a real sense of the South Pacific Ocean itself as a place, not just a mass of water. So I'll give it five out of five splashing in the surf. We also give a star rating. Would you recommend this movie to a friend? Would you, Dave? The cinematography was great, and there was a lot of good material here. But for the reasons we discussed earlier, the show didn't quite do it for me. Their narrative structure zigged and zagged a bit too much, but it's still an educational production and compelling enough that I'll give it three stars out of five. 
What are your thoughts? It was thrilling. So many interesting animals and plants and tantalizing glimpses into people's cultures. But the episode that really hit me was episode six, Fragile Paradise, and how we need to get our act together as a planet. So on our website, we've added in a section about what we can all do to save our oceans. And it's one place to start if you're moved to act. So anyway, in terms of rating the show, it's not perfect, but it moved me. So I'm giving it three and a half out of five. It's time for Find the Island. With so many islands in the world, it's challenging to choose which to visit. With this Find the Island segment, we're learning more about islands and even discovering islands that are new to us. Maybe it'll help you choose which to visit, either in person or on a future episode of Island Watch. So here's how to play. One of us gives a series of clues and the other tries to work out what island it is. Best of all, you can play along at home. Today, it's Dave's turn to highlight an island. All right, here's a clue. This is a group of eight islands that are perhaps best known for seals and salt. The slogan on their tourism website is Blue Sea and Red Cliffs. You know, I have been reading and watching videos on French cooking lately, so, so I immediately think of French sea salt. So is this near France? No, it's not. Here's another clue. Some of the activities on the islands include lighthouse tours, paddle boarding, sea kayaking, windsurfing, and fishing. Those are pretty typical island activities, so it's not really narrowing it down. Okay, maybe this will help. Politically, these islands are part of a province of 8 million people, but the islanders number only about 12,000. Plus, they're closer geographically to two other provinces than to the one that they're part of. Mm, I'm thinking, okay, when you say province, I think Canada. Yes. And I'm thinking French still. <laughs> so are these close to Quebec? Depends what you mean by close. <laughs> okay, maybe just give me another clue. All right. Well, Mi'kmaq people visited the islands for hundreds of years before the first European to sight them. That was Jacques Cartier in 1534. Okay, we talked about the Mi'kmaq people when we visited Cape Breton, which is part of Nova Scotia, but nobody speaks French out there and none of those maritime provinces have anywhere near 8 million people. So it has to be Quebec, right? Yes. Okay, one final clue maybe. Uh, the English name for this island chain is slightly different from the French name. I think it's... Um... I'll just take a guess and say the Ile de la Madeleine. Yes, we. Oui. It's Les Îles de la Madeleine, or the Magdalen Islands, as they're sometimes called in English. And the islands are part of Quebec, which is the largest French-speaking province in Canada. The archipelago is located in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but they're actually closer to Prince Edward Island and Cape Breton than they are to the Gaspé Peninsula on the mainland. I, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> Before COVID, tourism was an important part of the economy. I mean, eco-tourists would come to see baby harp seals in February. In summer, people would come for the many kilometers of white sand beaches and those steadily eroding sandstone cliffs, as well as camping and the water activities I mentioned. And you mentioned salt, so can I buy some delicious salt from there? Well, there's a salt mine on, on one of the islands, and it employs about 200 people. But the salt is used mainly on roads during winters on the mainland. Okay, so maybe not the kind I want to sprinkle on my green beans. Now, the islands are windswept and rugged. I mean, I've never been, but I have been fascinated with this place ever since I saw a Quebecois movie called Mario, which is set there. It's about Mario... Not the game. <laughs> no, it's Different not, not. Mario. It's about a young boy named Mario. Actually, there's an English dub of the movie available on YouTube, and we'll put a link to it in our show notes. It would be really nice to go there someday. 
Uh, it would be nice to go just about anywhere, but I have to say islands are probably always my first choice of travel destinations and this sounds like a sweet place to go. Well, the South Pacific and Les Îles de la Madeleine. What a trip. We're headed back on board now and setting sail for another port. Our next destination is the final show for this season, our second Archipelago special, with all kinds of island news and updates. It's lots of fun. Don't miss it. Yeah, I love our Archipelago episodes. So do tune in next time for another great Island Watch adventure. And in the meantime, tell your friends about us. Follow us on Twitter at Island Watchcast. Our email address is islandwatchpodcast at gmail.com. And visit our website at islandwatchpodcast.com for show notes and more. Fair winds and calm seas. This has been a production of Phosphine League. Phosphine League. Phosphine League. Phosphine League. I'm not getting on that boat. Mm-mm.